Now in today's class, we're going to start exploring how we can build programming languages of our own. Now there are two main ways to build a programming language. You can either write an interpreter, which walks over the code and gives it meaning, or you can write a compiler, which translates that code down into a language spoken by some other lower level implementation framework. For example, C++ is frequently compiled to binary code to run on, for example, AMD or Intel type processors in x86 assembly language. Now to build a programming language, we need two things. We need a syntax for the language that specifies what the language looks like. We also need a semantics that actually gives a meaning to the language. And that's the main thing we're going to be focusing on in the course. Now for this entire class, all of our programs, the syntax for our language is just going to be represented by building up racket data types. And this is the most beautiful thing about Racket. It's going to allow us to quickly implement compilers and interpreters for a whole different variety of languages. And we can do that just by using quasi-quoting, pattern matching, and quasi-patterns. Now this also means that instead of having to write a separate parser and way to manipulate syntax and turn it into, for example, an abstract syntax tree, we don't have to do any of that. All of that traditionally kind of hard work on parsing and reading in input we don't have to do it. We can just use racket data types. Now here's an example of what I mean by this. I'm going to define a language named if arith that we're going to be using for the rest of the week, today's lecture and then the next lecture after this on natural deduction style semantics. This language, if arith, includes basic arithmetic operations. So for example, we've got constants, but then it also includes plus and divide along with negation, which is not, and then also branching, if, where I've got some guard expression and then some true expression and false expression to be executed. So I'm saying that any integer in racket is also a program in our language. Now this expertha expression, remember, what it's doing is it's defining what my programming language means. You're going to write lists in racket that in Racket are just data. Racket doesn't know anything about what the meaning of that is, although it looks a whole lot like actual Racket code when you write it out as data. I'm giving it meaning by saying an expression in my language is defined by this expertha predicate. One of the base values in that language is just integers. So any integer in Racket is also an integer program in my language. Similarly, if E0 is an expression, satisfying expertha, and e1 is an expression satisfying expertha, then plus e0, e1, where I actually substitute the bodies for e0 and e1, that's also an expertha. So I can always take two sub-expressions and put them together to form an expression. And it's the same thing with other things like plus and divide, not, if, and other things like that. So here are some sample expressions that we've got. And remember, these are expressions in a new language that I'm about to define. This is not racket code. It's really helpful if you remember, this is code that's in a language that I'm building. This language, I'm going to call it if arith. But to the racket interpreter, all it is is data. Racket doesn't know anything about how this code executes because I put this quote right here. The moment I put the quote in front of some piece of data, Racket stops interpreting it, and it turns just into structured data. Right? And because of that, I can get this list right here that looks a whole lot like a call site in a Racket, but I'm actually just regarding it as a piece of data. Now this list in Racket, this S expression, satisfies this expertha predicate. All right, and because of that, I'm going to say it's an expression in my language, which I'm calling, again, if arith. Now, similarly, this racket list right here is also an expertha that falls within if arith. Now, in my language, I'm going to make a certain choice. It's going to be a little bit easier if the only base type in our language or the only base kind of value is just numbers. I don't want to have to deal with managing numbers and also Boolean expressions. And so for now, what I'm going to say is that anything that's zero is regarded as false and anything that's non-zero, so any number that's non-zero is regarded as true. 
So this expression right here says if zero, which you should regard as false, I'm just telling you that's what it is. I haven't defined its meaning yet, but I'm going to in a few more slides. So I'm saying if zero, which is false, then plus one, two, otherwise div two, two. And similarly, this last expression right here says if zero, or I could also equivalently say if three, but if zero, then plus one, and note that I can have this nested sub-expression for div down here. I can also have this nested if right here. That's because anything that's an expert huh, can also fit inside this third position right here. Now, I want to talk for a few seconds about a really, really important note. This is something that I've seen students struggle with again and again and again. And it's that the students don't always differentiate between the language that they are defining and Racket itself. We are going to be using Racket to build programming languages. And it is so crucial for whenever you're working with a piece of data, think carefully to yourself, is this data or is this piece of code that I'm interacting with, is this Racket code? Or is this code in the language if arith or whatever other language I'm defining? So I'm going to be defining this new language. In my language, like I said, booleans, instead of just being true and false, I'm just going to regard zero as false and everything that's non-zero is true. This is a convention borrowed from my sort of roots as a C programmer. And just to say this one last time, because this is really confusing and it's something that I consistently see students get tripped up on for totally understandable reasons. When you're writing interpreters, be very careful to always mentally page in and differentiate the language that you're defining from the language you're using to build the interpreter, which in this course is going to be Racket. It won't always be Racket. Maybe you'll go off and get a job writing an interpreter in Rust or something like that. But in this course, it's going to be Racket. And this can be very confusing because the languages we're going to define, they're going to look a lot like Racket. All right? And so just be careful when you're writing these interpreters, always ask yourself, is this Racket code that I'm interacting with? Or is it code in the language that we are defining in the assignment? And if you don't know, that can be a point where frequently students get confused. Frequently I see people who just, they don't quite know how to differentiate what expressions or languages are being used where. And so that's something that if you're confused about, please do reach out for help. This is a really important and key point to understand. All right, so how am I going to build a programming language? So we're gonna teach you a ton of different ways to do it. They all have different trade-offs in terms of their complexity, in terms of implementation, and also things like speed and ability to rapidly prototype them, ability to implement code that works really, really fast. And so today I'm going to teach you the simplest way that I know how to do it, which is called metacircular interpretation. The key idea here is that you're going to write a racket function named interp. Its job is to take an expression in the language you want to define, to interpret it, and to give you a racket value as its result. That constitutes the result of running the program. Now in our simple language, if arith, we're only going to have one kind of value. And that kind of value is going to be integers. Now, eventually, we're going to start building programming languages in which we have other kinds of values as base values. In particular, we're going to want to have functions in our language. Now, I've found from teaching students how to write these kinds of interpreters that they frequently get tripped up when they have to learn all of these concepts at once. So I'm not going to teach you how to implement functions at first, which in general you're going to use lambdas and closures to do. I find it kind of confusing to explain those topics along with having to learn the basic way that the interpreter works. So for now, I'm going to consider this restricted language that we just showed, Experha, to explain precisely how interpretation works. We're going to be able to write an interpreter very quickly. And now I just want to briefly remark and say, our job, again, is to write a function named evaluate that accepts an expression as its argument and produces a value as its result. In this case, it's going to be an integer, huh? Because like I said, 
values in my programming languages are going to be integers. All right, so before we go off and just kind of start madly hacking at the code, let's ask ourselves, what should the results for these following three expressions be from our interpreter? That way we'll have some test cases to start with as we go about trying to implement our interpreter. All right, so how about this first case here? We've got plus one, two. All right, so one evaluates to itself. You can't really do anything else. And two doesn't have anything you can do with that. So we've got one and two and then plus there. So one plus two is just three. So this should evaluate to three. Okay, what about this next one? If zero plus one, two, otherwise divide two by two. Well, okay, so we said in our language a few slides back, I said, um, we are defining this new language. And remember, this is just a rule that I'm imposing. I, I'm the person who's creating the programming language and I get to make the decisions. And I'm saying in our language, we're going to say that values that are zero are gonna be regarded as false and values that are non-zero are gonna be regarded as true. So here we say, if zero, then plus one, two, otherwise divide two, two. All right, so this one is going to take the false branch because we wanna take the zero interpretation and then two divided by two is just going to be one. And then this last case here, I'm going to take the true branch because we've got something that's non-zero. And then I'm going to perform divide four of three. All right, so now let's start to build out the evaluation function ourselves. So I'm gonna switch over to, all right, so I'm gonna switch over to Ra Dr. Racket over here. I've got this function expert, huh? that is just the function specifying what expressions look like. And to refresh ourselves, let's remember this first expression here, I've got plus two, one, this is an expert, huh? So is this one, if zero, then plus one div two, three. Otherwise, if one plus two, three, otherwise zero. I think this is actually, uh, this is, yeah, this is E2. And then we've got E1 over here, which is, uh, plus one, two, otherwise divided two by two. All right, so let's start writing our interpreter. We know that our interpreter has to return a number as its result. So we said E is an expert, huh? And this and evaluate returns a number N. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna match on E. Now let's say that E is just an integer. How do you evaluate an integer? Well, you can't really do any work uh, because you don't really have anything to do. And so instead, all you're gonna do is just return that number in. So if you match E and you find that it's an integer, well then you're good, you're already done. E is already a value, so you just return it. Read right about the case where you've got E0 and E1. Well, in general, E0 might not just be an integer, right? Consider this case where we've got something like plus, plus, two, three, one. If you match E0, you might expect that this would be a number, but it's not. In general, it could be another expression of arbitrary depth. So how are you going to turn that into a number? Well, here's the key. This evaluation function can be used recursively to evaluate the children of this node right here, this plus application can be used to recursively evaluate E0 and E1, and then we can just combine their results by using rackets plus. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna say plus evaluate E0, evaluate E1, and it's gonna be the same thing for divide, evaluate E0, evaluate E1. Now you might say to yourself, we're not checking whether E1 ends up being zero. What's gonna happen when we do that? Well, we're just using rackets divide. And so we'll just get an error from racket if E1 ever ends up being zero. And this is a key point that I'm going to mention in the slides in a few more minutes which is that when we're coding interpreters up in this style, in this meta-circular style, we're using features from Racket, the host language, 
to implement a semantics for the target language, if a rith. Because if we're using features from Racket to implement those other features, we're going to inherit properties of Racket. So for example, we're going to inherit, inherit the error handling that Racket has for division. All right. Okay, so what about this not predicate? Or sorry, this not test right here. So how are we going to evaluate this? So we want this to return one when e guard or no. Let's see. What do we want to do? So first we want to evaluate e guard. First evaluate e guard down to a value which is just a number. If that value is zero, then the result is one because not of zero is just non-zero or one. Otherwise, if the result is non-zero, then this should return zero. So how are we gonna do that? We're just going to call if evaluate e guard, and then we're going to say if that is equal to zero, then we're going to return one. Otherwise, we're going to return. Otherwise, we're going to return zero, because we got something that wasn't zero. Not of that is then going to be zero. And remember. This is just all what we are defining in our language. It's our language to define. We could define the semantics to be whatever we wanted it to be, but we're just setting that up ourselves right now. We're using Racket to help us define that by building an interpreter for the language. All right, so now how do we implement if? This is our last branch. What are we gonna do? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say if and first, we want to evaluate this expression e0 here down to a value. Now, if that value is zero, that means we should take the false branch. If the value is non-zero, it means we should take the true branch. So let's see what happens, but I'm actually gonna leave a little bit of a bug in the interpreter, and we'll see what happens when we actually execute it. So let's do something like, let's do, if evaluate e0, if that's equal to 0, then we're going to return the false branch, e2. Otherwise, we're going to return the true branch, e1. All right, so now let's see whether our interpreter works. All right. So let's just do, maybe we'll comment out this, uh, comment out these comments for a second. Let's see what happens. So now we're going to do interpret if zero, one, otherwise two. Oops, evaluate if zero, one, otherwise two. Now that ends up being two. So it looks good so far, but it's subtly wrong. Let's see what happens when I do evaluate if zero, one, and then plus one, two. Well, this result is plus one, two, but I said that evaluate is supposed to return a number. So what did I mess up? Well, it turns out I didn't actually evaluate the results of E2 and E1. And that's the crucial difference. So let's fix that, and then we'll be done writing our interpreter. Evaluate E2, and then evaluate E1. All right, so let's run that program. And now let's uncomment the test that I've got for it. And we'll see. All right, plus two, one, evaluates to three, and should be three. If zero and all this stuff evaluates to one and should be one, Ooh, this one is wrong. If zero plus one div two three, if one plus two three zero evaluates to five and should be four thirds. Let's see, where did we mess up? So we've taken the zero branch. So then here we should take, let's see the false branch here, evaluate this one. This should be the true branch. 
Oh, should be correct. So it looks like the comment's wrong. So this one should be five. So it looks like we got ourselves right. The test was just wrong. Well, how pleasant. All right, so I'd like to wrap up today's lecture by discussing some of the theory behind what we did. Now, we're going to be discussing a lot of this in the next video in which we talk about a formal semantics using mathematics that actually grounds what we just did. However, I just want to say that what we built was called a metacircular interpreter. And this is a really important definition that I will put on the exam. So a metacircular interpreter is an interpreter which uses features of a host language in which you're using to write the interpreter to define the semantics of a target language. All right, so you might ask yourselves, what features of Racket did we use to define our target language, which we called if a riff in this lecture? Well, let's go back to our interpreter and just inspect it. So for example, I can see I inherit the definition, for example, of plus in Racket. If I didn't have Racket giving me an implementation of plus, well, then I wouldn't be able to possibly write this language. Similarly, Racket has a representation for numbers and integers that I'm using to represent integers in my language. So I'm thinking of integers in my language sort of sitting in, inside of Racket, which is kind of the host language that's implementing our language. And this is a very old idea called definitional interpreters or metacircular interpreters. The paper actually goes back to John Reynolds. This is one of the most famous formative papers in programming languages. And this was actually written when John Reynolds was at Syracuse University back in 1978. Now, I also want to say our interpreter right now, even though... Now, I'm going to end lecture by just pointing out our metacircular interpreter is a pretty nice little way to write languages. And in practice, a ton of people actually do implement languages like this, but it's not quite the most efficient thing. And that's because it's actually relying on the racket stack. So look, for example, when I evaluate my expression E0 and E1 right here, my interpreter is direct style. It's not tail recursive. And so that means I'm using the Racket stack. And Racket's not the fastest language when it comes to hopping through the stack in memory and things like that. And so we're actually going to find in the future that there are some slightly more efficient ways you can do this if you're willing to implement the stack yourself. And that's going to be something that has to do a lot with the definition of what it even means to uh, implement control flow, a topic we're going to talk much more about later in the course. We talk about continuations. So in the next lecture, we'll be talking about some mathematical foundations that actually grounded what we did in formal theory. And that's going to provide the mathematical analog to the code we just wrote.